A great hobbit once said, I wonder if we'll ever be put into songs or tales. If a son will say, I want to hear about Frodo and the ring, and the dad will say, oh yes son, that's one of my favorite stories. Turns out the answer is yes. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bagginses? We are back today to talk some more Lord of the Rings, and this is, of course, 1954's The Two Towers, the middle book of the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Mr. J.R.R. Tolkien. So, guys, it is time, once again, to go back to Middle-earth and talk about this amazing, amazing trilogy that I hold so, so precious, just like many, many others. So, let's go ahead and get into it, guys. This one's a little different than the original because it splits our cast up into separate kind of stories here. In fact, he actually kind of breaks this one into books, which we'll get into. Books within the books, that is. But uh, I first read this one in high school, guys, when I first discovered, oh my God, this is the sequel to The Hobbit? And yes, that did happen to me. Uh, but uh, I obviously, I got the trilogy and read all three of them back to back to back. But, you know, I like to bring up there. I've read it countless times since, obviously. But uh, this one sometimes gets uh, dubbed as middle book syndrome, and I disagree, and we're going to talk about why. So no actual plot spoilers, guys, for this book, but I'll have to talk about Fellowship of the Ring some just to make sure you know where our characters are and stuff in this book. So if you haven't seen the movies, you haven't read the first book, I say maybe go ahead and uh, read Fellowship of the Ring at least first before you come here because I don't want anyone mad that I ruined uh, some things for them about maybe a character that died or something like that. And, uh, you know, all those things that we uh, so commonly hear on the old book too. So let's go ahead and get into it, guys. Let's go ahead and talk about what is this book about. Now, Frodo and his companions of the ring have been beset by danger during their quest to prevent the ruling ring from falling into the hands of the Dark Lord by destroying it in the cracks of doom. They have lost the wizard Gandalf in a battle on the mines of Moria, and Boromir, seduced by the power of the ring, tried to seize the ring by force. While Frodo and Sam made their escape, the rest of the company was attacked by orcs. But now they continue their journey alone down the great river Anduin. Alone, that is, save for the mysterious creeping figure that seems to follow them wherever they go. Guys, 1954, all the way back to the two towers. All right. Let's go ahead and kick it off, guys, with what makes this book good or bad. Now, with me, guys, uh, it's going to be mostly good. That's why I kind of say it that way. Uh, I, I have to keep the same format for every book, but uh, it's going to be you know overflowingly positive, this whole trilogy is. But with this one, I think... Something that commonly gets brought up as a detraction, I think is actually a great addition, and that is the splitting up of the cast here. Now, we know where the last book ends, the Fellowship has kind of been splintered here, uh, but uh, I think what really is great about this is that Tolkien originally planned to have this be two books, and he was planning on naming them what? The Treason of Isengard, which was going to be Aragorn's party, and The Ring Goes East, which is Frodo's party. Uh, so, I mean, he technically does that in this book. You know, he has a book one and a book two. Uh, it's, I guess, technically there are book three and book four, but it really depends on what edition of the book you were reading. This one has it listed as book one and book two. Uh, but uh, with this, I think it was a great idea because it kept several things. It kept any characters from getting buried. I think that's something that could do as the cast does get bigger in this one. But the biggest thing that I like about it is splitting the characters up like this having the different traveling parties is you get to see more of Middle Earth. You get to see all kinds of new locations. You get to see Fangorn. You get to see Rohan, Helm's Deep, River Anduin already kind of talked about, uh, Emin Mule, Ithilien. We get to see all kinds of places that we didn't get to see in the first one. You know, and if you were like me, you were studying that Middle Earth map the whole time and seeing all these things. So getting to actually go there and visit them was a great idea by splitting the cast up. And I kind of like that he doesn't go back and forth. That's another thing, a point of contention has been that, yeah, well, I don't want to go half the book without knowing what's going on with these characters. That's going to kind of depend on you. For me, it helped the story flow better because you didn't have to keep on going back. And you just understand that these kind of are happening concurrently at the same time. So uh, you get your one group, which is Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas. They are trying to save Merry and Pippin, who were captured at the end of Fellowship 
of the ring. And on the other side, you get Frodo and Sam, who are now alone trying to make their way to Mordor until they meet a certain guide that will try to help them get to Mordor. A guide that is very, very dangerous, but uh, I feel like there's no one who knows about the story that won't know what character that is. But for the sake of, like I said, no plot spoilers, I will not tell you who that character is. But uh, if you've read The Hobbit, I think it will be something that you're very, very familiar with and you have a, a very... Um, Interesting reaction one way or the other, negative or positive. So uh, there we go. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But uh, I, I like not only did we get to see new lands, new kingdoms, you got to see a lot of new characters from those kingdoms. You got to see what Theoden, you got to see Wormtongue, Eomir and Eowyn, uh, Faramir, uh, Shelob. Shelob is one that I would say you get to you get to meet again. And uh, <laughs> that's a, it's very much a character, guys. It's, it's a very, very, very creepy character. But uh, getting to do that, it just again, it makes the world start to feel bigger. You know, you, you, you look at the map and you say, okay, this world's very, very big. We really went like this far we didn't go you know too too far we really up there like in the northwest northeast kind of in in the hobbit so now we're getting to see a lot of the southeast and you know beyond so uh that's that's great i, I always love the fact that he can make this world feel bigger by splitting this party up so uh again it, it's going to kind of depend on if you like the fact that he does do the entire first half of the book is just from this point of view and then the other half of the book is the rest of those characters point of view there is no overlap with them so uh, i love it i love it i love the way that it works out but i do love that he doesn't do that with uh with the third book but we'll get there eventually i like having aragorn and gimli and legolas kind of on like a rescue mission for Merry and Pippin. And one of the things I like about it, guys, is this is where he starts to expand his characters a little bit. If you felt like the first book was a lot of character introduction, this is where he starts to get into developing those characters. And I really think showing this uh, budding friendship, you know, that was like unheard of between Legolas and Gimli. Now, it might be a little more reluctant from Gimli's point of view, you know, because, you know, he doesn't trust elves, but, uh, you know, no dwarf does. But it, it's, it's fun to see these two that you know do not really like each other at first starting to get a first it's kind of like a begrudging respect for one another and this is where they start doing their like uh, counting who's got more kills and it's just amusing it's something that goes through the rest of the series uh, i always love that little competition between the two of them but i, I really do dig that uh, as far as uh you know when we get to other parties there is a third party guys that, that, that i'm not mentioning here because well you'll see but we get introduced to Treebeard and the Ents. And this is not only the most magnificent thing, uh, it's it's some chapters that are, they're, they're pretty long. I will not deny that. They are pretty, pretty long. But I enjoy Treebeard quite a bit. And I enjoy everything about the Ent culture. You know, the stories that he will tell and stuff. So you get to know all about the Ents. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just great stuff, guys. I, I, I can't say too much without uh, just full on going into spoilers, which I feel like everyone knows at this point, but for the sake of sticking to the format here, I'll just say uh, it's a great, great character. And uh, those chapters might seem overly long to some people and other people like me are gonna really, really enjoy them if you're wanting to hear about basically the the history of the Ents and how they got to where they are, uh, why they're looking for these things called the Ent Wives, things like that. It's just, it's just, it's compelling stuff. But uh, I, I dig that a lot. Another thing I really, really dig about splitting these uh, this group up is in the first one, you always felt like Aragorn and Legolas and Boromir, they were there to protect the Hobbits. You know that they were never. I mean, there was bad things going on, but you always felt like those characters were there to protect the Hobbits. Now Sam and Frodo are on their own. They're vulnerable. They're right out there in the open. You know, someone like a, just just some dude with a sword could come up and take the damn ring from them. Really is. It really does feel like a sense of not just that kind of danger, but also that you know they could just be killed any moment. You know, some archer could be just hiding in a tree and just psh, psh, dead. You know, thinking they're just going to come collect, like collect their food or something, and then they go, "Oh, wow, that's a shiny ring. Let me put it on. Oh my God!" You know, so uh, yeah, it, it raises the sense of danger. I also like this impending sense of doom that this book has a lot. Uh, when you got like the waiting for the Battle of Helm's Deep, that is always just like that sense of foreboding. I've said one of the things I didn't like about military fantasy is the waiting, but like this does it right. The waiting is because you just feel like you know this is just a bunch of farmers and stuff and they're going children and they're going to try to fight you know 10,000 the Rukai that's insane right but it's 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 so good it's so good that the the, 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 the feeling of doom that I could actually put in you know obviously Tolkien being a war veteran spending some time in trenches I can see that's where he's kind of drawing upon that that sense of just waiting to your probably most likely your doom you know so uh yeah good stuff but i feel like he really plants the seeds for the conclusion of the series really really well there's a part with worm tongue in this that kind of sets up some events in book three quite well that in my memory 
uh, when I last reread it, I couldn't remember because guys, at this time, at this point, I'm not gonna lie. I've watched the movie so many times, I almost start to get mixed up what happened in what movie and what happened in what book. Because there's events that happen in this book that don't happen until uh, movie three. There's some events that happen in movie three that are in book two, vice versa. So it, it, it's one of those things I kind of have to sit back and think about. Now there was a part, uh, you know, in Isengard that I couldn't remember if it was in book number three or book number two because of the way they did it in the movie. But um, yeah, it, it's here and it does really set up the events to come in the the uh, the third book here but i love that this one kind of has almost like uh, some elements of horror in it you really do get some really chilling stuff in here and you think from 1954 this is probably just terrifying now uh i'm not gonna lie to you guys i'm scared of a certain eight-legged arachnid <laughs> you know and so that does kind of play into the story for me quite a bit but those chapters are just written just just freaky they are just scary as hell they really are so uh, the fact that he's able to write like that i think about that uh the dead marshes the dead marshes is kind of just nightmare fuel in this book so uh, he really was you know kind of flexing his muscles a little bit and like you know what it's okay to get a little scared. I mean, these guys are in serious danger, and this world can be very, very scary. Not all fantasy worlds are created equal, and Middle Earth uh, might not be as brutal as some of those other fantasy worlds that we've known and loved, but it's not exactly what I would call safe. You're not just going to go for a stroll at 3 a.m. in the morning. So I think he really does kind of uh, hit on that thing. But as always, guys, no book is perfect. Are there some bad things here? Now, for me, they might not necessarily be bad, but I want to bring them up in case you are apprehensive about these things. Treebeard chapters drag on quite a bit. Now, I do love them, but I can definitely see a first-time reader being like, this needs to be wrapped up. Come on, Mr. T. I think that people will feel like that a little bit. Uh, for me, again, I love the character. I love the silly stories that he will tell. I love some of the culture of the Inch and some of the things they talk about. So I, I, I'm down with it, but I can see some people thinking this is way, way, way too long. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, that's a valid criticism. It really is. It might feel like Aragorn and his company are on somewhat of a side quest. Now, I will say in the end, it makes sense because you need Rohan on your side in this battle. But if there are people who are like, okay, they start the book doing this and then they go do something completely different. That's when it's like, okay, uh, uh, what are we doing here? So you might have that a little bit, but it makes sense. It will make sense to you. But I'm just saying that that is some things that uh, some people might get that feeling of, uh, why are we not on the quest proper anymore? We're not on the same quest that we were in in book number one, but it will be worth it. Just trust me there. I also think that death in this world can kind of feel cheapened by the return of a character thought dead. Now, for me, it was fine because it's a character I loved and I wanted back. And I will say this character is very different than the, they were last time you saw them. So there is that. But I, I knew that there are some people who feel like death uh, isn't fine on this world because of things like that. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you guys, a uh, member of the Fellowship dies in this book and does not come back. So it is not always, the, not all deaths are created equal. Let's put it that way. So, uh, but I can see why there are some people who have a problem with that. For me, in the end, are, is the sum greater than the parts? Yes, because it's a magnificent character that I wanted to come back, and I'm glad that it worked out the way that it did. But uh, I, will, I will lie, even when I was, you know, 15, 16, reading this first time, I was like, what? How? That doesn't make any sense. Well, he tells you, and it's like, oh, okay, well, I guess so. All right. But again, uh, it kind of just depends on you. you. We got so used, I think, to fantasy books that, you know, will kill all characters ruthlessly. You know, and uh, you will never see them again. And uh, I, I, they just might. Now, look, guys, this isn't like Malazan or something where everybody and their mother comes back from the dead. It just there is one thing like that that I think that some people have had uh, some some grunts and groans about, and I can see that. But guys, why should you read the Two Towers? I mean, if you thought the first book was just you know, 500 pages of character introductions. Well, this is going to be the book where you get the character development. You get to learn some more about Aragorn. You get to learn a lot more about Legolas and Gimli. You get to learn all kinds of things about these different lands and regions and other characters like Theoden. These are characters that are super important in the series, and you get to learn a lot more. So with this one, he's not just introducing characters. He's starting to develop them as well. So I really feel like this is where he hits his stride in this series. That's why I say there is no middle book syndrome in this story because he did intend for this to be one volume and the publisher made him split it into three volumes. I'm actually kind of glad that he did, they did because, you know, I, I think at this point anybody sees, you know, they see a book this thick, they automatically think, ah, I can't read that right now, you know. So uh, doing it in three volumes I think was much more digestible for people in the 1950s. But uh, I think if you love this world, 
that he introduced and you'd like to know more, that kind of thing, I think you're going to get that because most of the stuff that we like from the first book is in here and then you get to expand the world and check out new places, new locations, new characters, new beliefs, and new creatures. That's always a fun one to add on there, the new creatures that you meet in this land of Middle Earth. So I think if you are one of those types, it's a journey over destination, this will probably be the book for you because we are traveling quite a bit. And look, Sam and Frodo still got a long way to Mount Doom. It's quite a walk still. And you're gonna to get to see some of that walk, a lot of that walk along the way. So it isn't just Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas that are traveling all over the place. You get to see what the hobbits are up to as well. And I personally love that. So I don't feel like I said, like this suffers from middle book syndrome at all. But that brings me guys to my final thoughts. I love the two towers because I think splitting the cast up was a great idea. Because I really think if you start to get like the Hobbit, okay, we've got 15 main characters now. Some characters are just kind of kind of bleed together. Some are kind of kind of bleed in the background. You're going to not even know if they're still there. I feel like that could have happened if they had kept this group together and kept adding new characters. So splitting the cast up into two different ways and being able to add new characters in on both sides of that actually was really a genius move, I think. And keeping it separate, not trying to flow it all together, actually helped a lot. So it, it's it, again, that's going to be something, like I said, that comes down to you. Personally, I love it. I might have had a little bit of a weird reaction to it the first time I read it. I won't lie about that because the whole time I'm like, well, I want to know what's going on with this company, you know? But uh, again, it, it's for a reason, and I think it was a good decision. I really do. Uh, it gave us a chance to see a lot of new races, new kingdoms, uh, creatures, like I said. Tree beer parts can be very long, but I love them. And I feel like it sets the board perfectly, guys, for what is to come. And the final act, in, uh, the final events in this book are just electric and uh, just damn near cliffhanger, if I'll put it that way, and uh, somewhat frightening. It is some stuff that is somewhat frightening, and I think that's what just kind of made it stand the test of time. So for me, again, no middle, middle book syndrome at all. This is just every bit as good as the first book for me. I still like the first one the best because I feel like I am a character guy, and that's so much character introduction, but I also love character building, and that's all in this book as well. So, you want to see your big large-scale battle and things like that? This might be the one you're looking for, of course, because uh, the journey it goes ever on and on, right, guys? But uh, it will not be going forever on and on because we will be closing this series down next month uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Return of the King. Return of the King, thank you. Uh, Return of the King, uh, we'll be doing that actually this month because this is actually uh, you know, a couple days late. But uh, in, at the end of, by the end of August, we'll be doing Return of the King in time for Rings of Power on Amazon Prime. Now, hold on before you say anything, even if you're not in to what they're doing with Rings of Power, which I completely understand. It still feel like this is gonna be one of those times where you're gonna get interest in Tolkien maybe that you never had before. So that's why I definitely wanted to kind of do this then. But guys, this is one of my favorite fantasy worlds of all time, maybe my favorite. I mean, it's been my number one on a couple of rankings now. Um, th that's a conversation for another time, but look, th this is probably my favorite fantasy world ever. So I wanted to talk about these books uh, as much as I could. Uh, it, doesn't get as much interest from my audience because you know they're more into modern fantasy, I think, than classic, but uh, that's fine. These are books I love, I want to talk about them, and I want new people to discover them and give them a chance. And it is the best way I can talk about why I love them, you know? That's kind of why I'm here, to talk about why I love these books. And guys, I do love these books, and I hope that you do as well. So Two Towers, guys, what did you think? Why don't you drop in the comments and let me know, and I'll talk to you there.